What's up, y'all? Hey, guys. We are Embrace the Suck 21. Yes, we are. I'm Spencer. And I'm Daniel. And y'all blow up, for lack of a better term, the <laughs> Victoria Cross video a lot. And y'all yeah. threw this doc at us a lot. It was Jeremy Clarkson's The Greatest Raid of All Time. I'm here for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I feel like you had something <laughs> to say before we get I into it. I do have something to say. The VC is comparable to the Congressional Medal of Honor. Not the Purple Heart. With that being said, we can move forward. Yes, yes. I accept that. <laughs> like, I don't know where I was in saying that. So Don't drink in video at the same time. <laughs> All right. That's not what we were doing, YouTube. What? <laughs> let's just get into All it, All right, man. let's do it, man. Three, two, one. A couple of years ago, I made a TV program about my father-in-law who won a Victoria Cross at Arnhem. And since then, I've been on the hunt for a follow-up, another nugget of incredible heroism in the face of impossible odds. Of course, most war stories are well-known, well-documented and well-celebrated. The Battle of Britain, Rourke's Drift and so on. But one day, while trolling through a second-hand bookshop, I came across a story that's hardly known or celebrated at all. It's the story of an amazing battle, a battle where more VCs were earned more quickly than any other action in the Second World War. It's a story full of ingenuity, pluck and genuine courage. It had the lot. Having read it, I decided to do some digging. And it turned out that while very few people in the outside world know anything about this extraordinary battle, they certainly do in military circles. And they call it the greatest raid of all. All right, before we get into this, are you familiar with this? No idea. No idea. I know that there was a movie back in the day, uh, The Nazarene. Uh, I think that was World War II as well. Uh, no, probably no relation. Okay. So, I have no idea. Yeah, and if you don't know anything about it, I don't know anything about it. All right. So, let's go into it. In 1941, the Battle of Britain was won, but the Battle of the Atlantic was still raging, and we were losing. German U-boats were running amok among the convoys bringing supplies from America. Nine million tons of shipping had already been sunk, and the shipyards in Britain simply couldn't replace it fast enough. Britain was beginning to starve. Winston Churchill said in his diaries, the only thing that truly frightened me in the war was the U-boat peril. Said he was even more anxious about the Battle of the Atlantic than he was about the Battle of Britain. And then into the equation sailed the Tirpitz. Tirpitz was the fastest and most modern battleship in the war. Even though her armor was a foot thick, she could thunder along at 30 knots. And with eight 15-inch guns, she packed a huge punch. Certainly, the Royal Navy had very little in its arsenal to take on a ship of this magnitude. And that was a nightmare for the people who worked here in Churchill's war rooms. Each of these dots on this map represents a convoy movement. If Tirpitz got among them beyond the range of the Royal Air Force, Holy shit. we would almost certainly lose the war. It was that... Is, is that intense? That's a lot. Each of those dots represent a convoy? Apparently so. Holy crap. That's ton like a convoy is not one ship. One ship isn't a convoy. It's a multitude of ships. Yeah. That's a lot. I didn't know that. I'm not a Navy man at all. Right. I'm not a Navy man at all. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about naval nothing. All right. So yep. this is that's crazy to me. Yeah. Simple. 
There was, however, a drawback to Tirpitz's size. You see, if she were to be damaged while out in the middle of the Atlantic, she couldn't very well go back to Germany for repairs, because that would mean limping past Britain, past the RAF, past our coastal fleet, and that would be a death sentence for her. So she'd have to go to a dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France. But there was only one dry dock on the Atlantic coast of France that was big enough to handle a ship of Tirpitz's size. This one. This is the Normandy dock in Saint-Nazaire. It had been built in the 30s when France was making giant ocean liners. And now, to make sure the Tirpitz could never have a home on the Atlantic seaboard, it had to be destroyed. Oh, my God. Now, the only way that you could put this dock out of action is to destroy this gate. Dude. And that was a problem. It couldn't be done with a naval bombardment because the mouth of the estuary is actually six miles away in that direction. It couldn't be done with a submarine because this whole area was crisscrossed with anti-submarine nets. Couldn't be done over land because northern France was in German hands. And for two reasons, it couldn't be done from the air either. Firstly, Second World War bombing raids were notoriously inaccurate. Only 22% of bombs landed within five wow. miles of the target. Wow. Dang, um. So the chances of being able to hit a dock gate from 6,000 feet in the sky were slim at the best of times. And it wouldn't be the best of times because right next door to the dry dock were 14 U-boat pens. Wow. These were some of the most precious facilities in the German armory. And to protect them, the San Nazaire area bristled with 80 anti-aircraft guns and artillery pieces. And in the town itself, there were 5,000 troops. Destroying the dock then using conventional forces, the army, the air force, the navy, out of the question. So the job was given to a group of men who really had only just been put together. The commandos. OK. The commandos were the brainchild of Churchill, who'd seen similar outfits operate successfully in both the Boer War and the First World War. A small number of highly trained soldiers would get in fast, do a huge amount of damage, and then get out before the enemy had time to get organized. Churchill liked this. He called it the butcher and bolt approach. So what kind of men were they? Well, if popular myth is anything to go by, they were lantern-jawed killing machines who could headbutt their way through oak doors. The reality, though, was rather different. Gerard Brett, in my regiment, was in my commando, 12th commando, and he'd written a book on the Byzantine age or Byzantine architecture or something. One fellow who got a divinity degree from Trinity College, Dublin. Lance Corporal Potts had been a a don at either Oxford or Cambridge. They included a poacher, a TT, motorcycle rider, so a mixed bag. What they represented was a complete revolution in the concept of soldiering. Because they were chosen for their individuality, their intelligence, their initiative. And nobody embodied that ethos more than this man, Mickey Byrne. Hmm. I've got his autobiography here, and what a life. He had a privileged upbringing, Winchester, Oxford, uh, and then he met Guy Burgess, the chap who went on to become a Soviet spy, and they became lovers. Uh, Mickey, though, became a Nazi sympathizer, went to Germany, met Hitler, got a signed copy of Mein Kampf, and was one of the very first people to be shown around Dachau, the concentration camp. He knew Bertrand Russell, he knew Audrey Hepburn, he knew the King and Queen, he even met Roosevelt, he really was a Telegraph obituary writer's wet dream. Wow. But all things considered, not the sort of man you'd expect to find in a commando's green beret. 
By the start of the war, however, Mickey had seen the Nazi threat for what it really was and had found something else to suit his maverick streak, the commandos. People were left to make up their own minds. In war, anybody, everybody may be killed and what decides the action may be the action of a private soldier who's left to command the trench. It wasn't put like that, but the feeling we were given that every single one of us might be as important as a brigadier. We were all individuals, you know. Discipline did matter, of course, but I wouldn't have said it was absolutely first. The commando forces were made up of volunteers from any of the regular army units, and the philosophy of how they went about their daily business was a million miles from that of the conventional military. For a start, they didn't bother with barracks or regimental headquarters because the commandos didn't want to waste training time on mundane chores such as cleaning or maintenance. Instead, they simply got digs in a nearby town. And there was no sergeant major on hand to tell them what to do every minute of the day. Instead of saying, parade tomorrow on the main square in Weymouth, it might be parade tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the... Um, uh, in the marketplace at Dorchester and find your own bloody way there, you know. You weren't shouted at. There wasn't any of this shouting or bullying or any, anything that you got uh, in the regular army. You led by example. So, you know, uh, the officer had, uh, had to do everything that you did. If the officers can do it, I can do it. If the officers can do it. Unfortunately, though, the British Army top brass were a deeply conservative bunch, and they really didn't like the new commando philosophy. The regular army were doing their best to get us disbanded. They hated us, some of them. We were a nuisance. And because our standards were so high, we'd creamed off the best of the people in, in the regiments. And in fact, That's... a lot of, lot of COs uh, refused to allow people to volunteer. This resistance by the regular... That's very true. All right, once you hit that top elite squad of stuff, like normal military protocols kind of go out the window mm -hmm. because you can't... The regular military protocols are to waste time, break you to conform, to conformity, make everyone react the same, treat... Yeah, like think the same that is how it's made but the elite squads that's different mm. you're talking about individuals training the individuals in their own craft you're like creating the the a team that balance each other yeah and that's a whole different mentality of training yeah they they know what to do they know what's what's up they don't need to be need as much direction yeah, yeah like for for us on this side would be like uh, like a enlisted special forces guy, which doesn't happen. But it'd be like him telling an officer to, to fuck off. Like, but within rights, because he's kind of like different. That mm -hmm. dude's different. Like, you see the guys with the beards at the, like, the chow hall, the mess hall, wherever you're at, like, you don't fuck with those guys. Because mm -mm. it's not regulation to have a beard overseas. You see the guys with the beards, they're in, don't fuck with them. Mm -hmm. Don't fuck with them. Like, that's that's the rule, you know? Um, but it's very interesting to see this. It's like how they were hated because the army, I guess, then was so traditional. They're like, what is this against the grain stuff? Let's let's judge them. Let's let's. But they were refining the individualistic attributes of each participant. So I, I that's forward thinking. I like that. Yeah. Quite progressive for its time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Army certainly got Churchill's back up. What I have here is a letter he wrote to the Secretary of State for War. And he says, I hear that the whole position of the commandos is being questioned. They've been told no more recruiting and that their future is in the melting pot. Says he feels very strongly about this. Uh, says, the defeat of France by Germany was accomplished by an incredibly small number of highly equipped elite while the dull mass of the German army came on behind. And then here, for every reason, therefore, we must develop the commando idea. Pretty clear cut. 
As 1941 drew to a close, Japan joined the war, and the Royal Navy had to send a fleet to the Far East. So there was even less to hold the Tirpitz at bay. What's more, we were losing the Battle of the Atlantic. We were losing in North Africa, and London was in ruins. So if Churchill's commandos really could smash up San Nazaire, it might give a sense back home that Britain wasn't finished just yet. Everywhere, almost, we were on retreat, and people were really becoming negative, and Churchill wanted something which would be successful aggression. The plan to destroy the 1,500-ton dock gate was codenamed Operation Chariot, and it was certainly bold. The commandos would get hold of a couple of destroyers from somewhere and sail them from Cornwall over to Western France. Uh, now, one of these destroyers would be filled with explosives. And while the RAF distracted the Germans with a bombing raid over Saint-Nazaire, they would somehow sneak it up the estuary without being seen by anyone in the gun emplacements here, 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 wow. here, 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 and here. Uh, or by anyone uh, with a searchlight here, 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 and here. Wow. And wow. then, to see what happens next, we have to turn to the actual model built to plan the raid. The destroyer, with the explosives in it, would ram the dock gates here, and the commandos would jump off, and right underneath all the guns uh, positioned to protect the U-boat pens here, they'd run around shooting anything that moved and uh, blowing up anything that didn't. Then... After the destroyer exploded, destroying the lock gate, they'd all meet here at this not at all exposed jetty and get back on the second destroyer, which somehow wouldn't have been blown to pieces <laughs> while it was uh, hanging around in the estuary for a couple of hours waiting for them to finish. It would then sail back down the estuary, past all the guns, and go home. That's, that's a black adder plan, <laughs> if I've ever heard one. That is... What in the f like, wait, wait. Like, just tell me it's a one way trip without telling me it's a one way trip. <laughs> like if I'm on this on, on this mission, I'm like, all right guys, my shit's in order. This is I'm not getting out. Like, that's basically what he's just telling me. <laughs> Goodness. Like, there's so many Im insane variables. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this ship there's two ships, big ass ships, not like little canoes. Go in. One doesn't get seen. How? We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. <laughs> we don't talk don't about be, that. Don't be negative. <laughs> don't, be, <laughs> don't be negative, dude. Just <sighs> stay over there on your side of the table. One doesn't get seen somehow, some way. The other one does its mission. Everything was amazing. Blood, bodies everywhere. <laughs> Only our bullets meet. And then we get out on this boardwalk of a dock. That's <laughs> the only way to get back to the ship. Great. Brilliant and oh, so it's just like Wal uh, Baldrick's war poem. Yeah, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. That's that's you know what exactly I mean? what that is. Yeah, that's, it's like okay, we'll we'll go with you on the first part. We'll get there, and then f you for having an escape plan because don't even tell me that at that <laughs> point. Don't even like if we're gonna go in to do this. Just F you with the escape plan because <laughs> it's going to go to shit. Any service member knows that you plan something, you you prepare for something, you train for something. It doesn't go like that. It never goes like that. That's how life is. That's how more so service is. Go there, expect something to hit the fan, and fucking... You're like, you barely make it to the sequel. <laughs> oh my god! So no wonder so many servicemen that I meet have stories that start with "I shit you not." Yeah. Hey, <laughs> what the plan was was <laughs> we were gonna go take a Pepsi out of the vending machine. Well, the Pepsi <laughs> machine blew up and killed half the people. Like <laughs> that, that's how it goes. Oh my goodness! So Jesus. Yes. I love the confidence, though. Mm -hmm. We're going to go there. Don't worry about the... 
it's not going to happen. It's all going to be, no one's going to know we're here. <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse me? He was like, the gun station's here, 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 here. That means a lot of people falling asleep, dude. A lot of people fall asleep at the same time. <laughs> oh, my God. So, to quote you, this plan is a mixture of what the fuck and what the fuck. <laughs> and, and with a little additive of a perfect Monday. Uh-huh. Like, like that. It's, it was probably a Monday. No one plans this plan on a Friday. This is a Monday plan. This is what this is. Let you party it up, and we'll hit you with this move on a Monday. Like, that's what this is. Oh, Holy shit, dude. Damn. I needed that. Right. The plan was presented to the War Office by Louis Mountbatten, head of the Combined Operations Unit, and unsurprisingly, it met resistance. One commander-in-chief was particularly vocal. I remember he started the meeting by saying, well, Dickie old cock, if you're prepared to lose all your soldiers and all your ships, I suppose you can take on this task, which I regard as absolutely impossible. I said, it's the fact that it is regarded as impossible, which makes it possible. The Germans will never think we'll attempt it. <laughs> How does it make you feel? Ugh. It's those guys. Granted, when it, when it works out, they got balls. When it doesn't, they have no regard for human life. That's how it works out. You got to have balls to make those decisions. Most big decisions that result in massive casualties, loss of human life, come from air-conditioned rooms. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. But you got to have those people out there that are forward-thinking, that are like, hey, man, this is a death sentence to anyone who we send on this mission. No one would be foolish enough to do this. It's so crazy, it just it, might work. Th that's it. And 99% of the time, it doesn't work. But the 1% of the times, that's what we hear about. And I'm going to make a prediction. This is the 1% of those times. Maybe. Matt Batten's enthusiasm certainly didn't rub off on the RAF. You can see here in these Operation Chariot minutes that the powers that be requested a force of about 100 aircraft uh, for the diversionary bombing raid uh, in three waves. But on the back, uh, Vice Marshal Sornby says, I don't agree that such a heavy scale of attack is needed. We want about 20 Whitleys, which are bombers, hanging around overhead, dropping an occasional bomb. And he's backed up by one of his advisors, this chap called Willits, who really says that Operation Chariot can uh, whistle for their 100 uh, bombers. He says Bomber Command can provide no more than 35 aircraft without prejudicing their other commitments. You might have thought the Navy would be keen, especially since the operation was designed to neutralize the Tirpitz. Yeah. But no. The Commander-in-Chief here from Plymouth Command writes, uh, the plan entails the sacrifice of the landing party and endangers two valuable ships for a small chance of success. He actually says negligible chance here. Wow. There's another guy writing here who says, um, I'm not hopeful as regards the result of the impact between the destroyer and the lock gates. I think the lock gates will remain partially intact and the destroyer will look silly. <laughs> silly. Happens, much of the proposed plan fails. Eventually, though, the Navy did find one boat. It was called HMS Campbelltown, a clapped-out American World War I destroyer that was on loan to the British. She was not Wait a minute. for the job. You guys crashing our shit into the gates? It was on loan. It was on loan. I had to put that out there. <laughs> yeah. It's on loan. Probably didn't get that deposit back, <laughs> right? <laughs> Safety deposit. <laughs> Give this back to us when you return the ship. Like, uh, okay, I see you, your little... 
<laughs> I love that. We'll take your loan, and we're going to just crash into a ship. I'm like, mm, sorry, bud, about that loan. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Love it. Known for her poor slow speed maneuverability and her large turning circle. But these drawbacks didn't dampen the spirits of the commandos. I thought we would get away with it, that I would be wounded romantically and a beautiful nurse would look after me in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I was very young. You were doing all this uh, heavy training and nothing's happening, so you're very frustrated. So I think when we were finally briefed on the model, I mean, we thought, well, hell, this is going to be something. We had been trained, both in the dark, blindfolded in the day, in every form of demolition to do with dock demolitions, and trains and anything. So when we heard that we were going to blow up the dock installations at saint Nazaire, um, I suppose really, uh, it was a feeling of elation. At this stage, people were saying, well, well what do you think? Be, you see, and I said it's going to be a piece of cake. We're going to go in there and uh, 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 knock six, knock them for six, because that reflected the the uh, optimistic attitude. We were going to go in there, blow up this bloody dock, and we'll be out. I love that. I love that. <laughs> There's he's, so much optimism there. He's the happy guy. <laughs> you know, he's the happy guy. He's the guy that's like, hey guys, at least we don't have. Restless leg syndrome, like on a march. Like, he's that guy. Like, we, don't, we don't talk to that guy. That's awesome. You need that. You need that optimistic guy. For us, it's like, it's, it is going to go to shit. And we have developed many plans for when it does. Like you have a plan A and you loosely plan around plan A. Heavily, heavily plan around plan B to Z. <laughs> Plan A, if it goes well, we, we, we skated one through. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not supposed to. This is awesome. Yeah. This is awesome. I love his optimism. I love his optimism. Fucking awesome. It's mm -hmm. going to be great. I'm going to get some scars, right? The acute nurse is going to, like, mend me back to health and we're going to get married. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good country <laughs> song. But, like, dude, what? <laughs> But that, that's why Plan B has its name. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and also, also the fact that, like, these guys have been, like, the outcasts of the traditional military because yeah. they're so out of the spectrum of what a military unit should be. Yeah, especially up to that point Up in to that time. point. They're like, they're, like, test, they're, like, in the test phase. Yeah. So this is the ultimate test to see if they hold any weight. So there's a lot of weight holding, there's a lot of weight behind this mission. Mm -hmm. So everyone's rearing to go. They've been trained probably to the breaking point and beyond. So to get this mission out is this like, well, let's, let's do it. Let's see what we're made out of. Heck kind yeah. Of thing. So that's, it's, it's crazy to me. I can't wait to get to the pot, that part. Mm -mm. We had volunteered after all for danger. And there did seem an off chance that it was impossible, and therefore it would succeed. As the commandos prepared on land, the Navy set about the Campbelltown. The old tub would have to sneak past 80 gun emplacements on its way up the San Nazaire estuary, so it had to be disguised, and they only had 12 days to do the work. What? In the end, they removed two funnels and sloped the other two backwards, so at a glance it looked a bit like a German destroyer. And then there was the problem of turning it into a time bomb. This job was given to a brilliant young naval officer called Lieutenant Nigel Tibbetts. He was a shy chap with a stammer who, when his girlfriend announced that she'd become fond of him, replied, well, then I suppose we shall have to get married. However, while he was not desperately confident with women, he was a whiz with explosives, one of the best students the Dartmouth Naval College had ever seen. But even he faced difficulties with how you turn a whole ship into a bomb. The first problem he had was deciding where in the ship 
to place the explosives. Because, you see, if you can imagine this is the gate to the dock and this is the ship, what's going to happen after it hits? I mean, is it just going to end up here, in which case you want the bomb in the front? Or is it going to rear up, in which case you want the bomb sort of wow. in the middle toward the bottom? I suppose, theoretically, it would be possible if the ship were going fast enough for it to actually ride right over the top of the gate and end up in the dock itself. I mean, who knew? Guys, for from experience, not, uh, not this experience, this is very unique, it matters. It matters. Like, the minuscule detail, when you're talking about demolitions of stuff, like, it fucking matters in a massive way. Like, where it's going to explode, how it's going to explode, it, it, it's, it's paramount. So, like, I give my hats off to these demo engineers. Like, dude, they know their shit. They're, nine times out of ten, they're not right in the head, but that's why we love them. They know how to bring shit down and blow shit up. You know, it's a very unique skill to have. But very valid. I'm glad that Clarkson touched on that. It's like, where does it explode? Not a lot of people think about that. Like, it's, it's simple. It's going to hit here and kaboom, and then we're in. Like, no, no. Yeah, and if you if you get that, if you don't have that kind of planning, you end up, what's it, like, uh, Only Fools and Horses with the chandelier. Yes, that's yeah. exactly it. Or the uh, Independence Day scene where the, the dude in the tank's like, target remains. You know, we're just like, fuck, we didn't do anything. We sent a nuke to it. Nothing happened. Mm. So. Yeah, but I more like dire in this. Yeah, <laughs> much, much. Oh, yeah. Day and night, Tibbet struggled with this until he decided on a spot 40 feet back from the prow, low down next to the keel. Then he had to work out how to set the explosives off. Back then, there was no accurate timing device, so he had to use fuses like this. What? So it's like a cigarette. The idea is that you squeeze the top part here, which breaks a glass capsule on the inside, releasing acid that then slowly burns through a strip of wire. Now, when that snaps, it releases a spring which boings out, setting off the detonator. Now, this was very advanced in 1942, but there were a couple of problems. First of all, it was very susceptible to jolts and shock. You wouldn't, for instance, want to ram some lock gates at 25 miles an hour with one of these on board because it might go off instantly, killing everyone. It was also very vague. The strength of the acid varied from fuse to fuse, the strength of the wire varied, the tension of the spring varied. Tibbets couldn't say to within an hour when the bomb might actually go off. Wow. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Choosing what explosive to use, however, was fairly straightforward. He went for Amatol, and to show how big a bang that produces, we've placed a pound of something similar between the front seats of this car. Three, two, one, fire in. Boom! That was a pound. Tibbets was going to use four and a quarter tons. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> even if the explosives and the fuses could be trusted to work properly, and even if they could get across to France without being detected and up the estuary without being blown to smithereens, and even if the Campbelltown could hit the lock gates exactly right and the commandos could get off and do whatever it is they had to do, they still had a problem. How do they get home again? Because the Navy wouldn't provide a second destroyer, they were instead given 16 of these. Today, this Fairmile ML is a tourist boat taking trippers around Torbay, and certainly it's better suited to this than it ever was for Operation Chariot. They're made of Bakelite bonded plywood. It was a cheap mass production boat designed primarily to make the Navy look bigger than it really was. May Godspeed all who sail in her. 
It certainly wasn't particularly good in the open sea. It tended to roll badly in a swell, which made everyone on board queasy. Ugh. It's not so bad if it was only used to bring the soldiers home, but this little fleet would also be used to get half the commandos out to San Nazaire as well. Oh my god. God, that sounds horrible. Oh my god. Wow. Could you imagine battling seasickness and then being the top of your your thing? Ugh. And doing shit that I, I couldn't imagine that. Oh my I god. I couldn't imagine. I don't have the focus to throw up and plant a bomb. Mm. Or and take out anyone. I'm taking out myself. Mm. Like, I couldn't <laughs> do that. No oh shit. Oh my god. Oh my god. So there'd be 15 commandos wedged down here with all their kit. And when they got to the other end, they'd be expected to get out and start fighting immediately. It's a jury. There wasn't only seasickness to worry about, because while each ship had small guns fore and aft, it didn't have any armor. No, really. All that stood between the German guns and the men down here were, um, a few planks of wood. Oh. And to make matters worse, each boat was fitted with two 500-gallon long-range fuel tanks, which were completely exposed on the deck. Oh, my God! Campbell Town was a bomb on purpose. These things, they were bombs by accident. Honestly, it's hard to think of any vessel less well-suited to the job in hand. The commandos were hard men, good fighters. But they'd been picked for their intelligence as well, so they must have known that the chances of getting to San Nazaire were small, the chances of doing the job were microscopic, and the chances of them getting home again on a wooden boat, groaning under the weight of exposed fuel tanks past an alerted enemy, were virtually non-existent. Yeah. Oh. They must have known that Operation Chariot, for the vast majority, like was going to be a one-way ticket. I salute you guys that have been in service with a family and or children. Because mm. that that's a whole different level of ball game, right? I I was in and I had nothing to lose. That's that made me invincible. Yeah, both you know, both Holly and Alexander weren't yeah. in the picture at the time. Holly, Alexander weren't in the picture. Girlfriend wasn't in the picture. I was untouchable. Right, you you had nothing to lose. At I had the time. nothing to lose except myself. The fact that people did this with the world to lose, like the salute isn't enough. Like it's just it's just massive. Yeah. It's a ma like you get handed this one way trip and you're like, holy crap, this is because these guys weren't stupid. None of these guys were stupid. No, no, <laughs> and 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 you know where the order comes from and you're like okay this is what looks like a one-way trip this is what it is and they still went through with it you know that's that's balls that i will never be able to understand i salute i respect but i will never be able to understand that that's yes. that's it's yeah. it it would cause me to buckle 100 mm -hmm. like if i had what i have now in that situation back in my my enlisted days, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Mm. You know, but this is a different level of human. Man. You know, that's 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 amazing. Those that's are amazing. some strong words. Yeah. So, it's and, amazing. And I, I will I, I obviously I can't speak on that, but I will I will take your word for it a hundred percent and just echo what you say. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oops. We were all of us told if we wanted to leave a letter for our next of kin or our loved ones, you could do so. And you wrote on the envelope to be posted in the event of my failing to return. Hello, so I'm Sergeant Bill Gibson, who um, I knew them all very well indeed. And I remember seeing his face and I knew he knew he was going to be killed. My dearest dad, by the time you get this, I shall be one of the many who have sacrificed their unimportant lives for what little ideals we may have. I can only hope that by laying down my life, the generations to come might in some way remember us and benefit by what we've done. At a time like this, I turn to you, Dad, and God. I hope there will be peace for everyone soon. 
My love to everyone. I'll remember you. Your loving son, Bill. <laughs> Somehow I thought he is unlucky to write your last letters, your parents. <laughs> no, my attitude was I'm like, coming back. Oh my god. I, Two of it's uh, like, men came to me and said... It's like... I'm torn between if it's a good luck charm or a bad, bad luck charm. It's like the opposites are so polar opposite, right? Like they're just so, it's either brings you luck or brings you death. Mm -hmm. um, Which part, the writing home to your, your yeah, parents? Yeah. Okay. To your loved ones. Like in a, in a, basically a suicide mission, like you have to accept that that is probably that's it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and accept that your body will be recoverable. Right now, we are very fortunate to just send texts, right? We're yeah. very fortunate to be like, and I love you. Remember me. Write a story. Yeah. You know, uh, emojis. A yeah, emojis. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. kind of where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, oh, my God, man, that must be. That I mean, it still is. It still is very, like, it makes you small. It makes you feel small when you're like, in case of, or in the most chances of my likely passing, this is what I want you to do. Yeah. Or this is what I want you to say. This is what, like, you get your affairs in order Yeah. as a young adult. Because all these guys were young adults. They weren't old. Right, right. They don't, they don't get anyone old. Mm -mm. They don't get mm -mm. this guy. No. <laughs> they don't no. get this guy right now. Yeah. To, to do this mission, you know? So that's very humbling. That's very, um, it gets you within the mindset of, of, of these people that are willing to lay the future out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the line for the country, for the cause, for mm -hmm. everything. So that is, is admirable to say the, like the very least. Yeah. You know, so that's anyway, that's incredible. just a thought, you know, having <sighs> the, the just in case notes close by. Yeah, yeah. That's something that's very like morbid, but at the same time honorable. That's it's just no one thinks about that. Like if you think about that, if you haven't been in the service, like think about that for a second. You basically have your just in case plan, like in your at least now in your vest. In you know that's just a thing. Yeah. So yeah, you never know if you're gonna need it. You never know. You never know. Yeah. And, and and you know what's morbid is that it's not for, it's not for you to find. Right. Right. It's for whoever opens you up that gets Yeah. It. Yeah. So that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Would you take these letters home to our wives if we are killed? And I said, but wait a minute. I'm going with you. Oh, you won't be killed, I said. They were both killed. The San Nazaire raiders weren't allowed to reveal details of the operation to their loved ones. But for the bomb designer Nigel Tibbetts, recently married and the father of a young son, the thought of keeping his wife in the dark was too much. So he told her. Oh. And she said afterwards they both sort of knew he wouldn't be coming back. Mm. Oh my God. So as the commandos Gather oh. here in Falmouth in Cornwall, ready to join the Campbell Town and the little boats that were anchored out there in the bay. Lord Mountbatten gathered them all together and very unusually, he said to them that any man who wanted to step down could walk away without a stain on his character. Not one of them did. Wow. The 26th of March, 1942, the Armada set sail. With 264 commandos and 357 Navy personnel on board. That's a total of 621 men. Only 227 would come back. Mm. Oh, my. I had just enough. The 
night to, to read a book that I, that I was, was, was reading, and I just concentrated on reading this book. The thought that crosses your mind is, I hope I'm going to be able to do my part, uh, you know, without being overcome by, by fear. We chatted to each other about what we're going to do, and I, we all went through it with our blokes, you know. I, I and my four guys just went through what we were going to do. I certainly thought to myself, my God, I hope I'm not going to show fear in front of my men if I'm frightened. Tents, I suppose, would be the thing. Uh, anticipation, yes. Fortunately, I think we were more worried about it, the, the, it being rough because uh, it's very, uh, as you can imagine, physically exhausting to be seasick all the time. Mm. But we were lucky. It was calm. 33 hours later, they arrived at the mouth of the estuary, and the captain of the Campbelltown, Lieutenant Commander Sam Beatty, instructed Tibbets to set the fuses on his bomb. He then began to creep up the estuary. Ideally, he'd have stuck to the deep water channel, the channel the Tirpitz would have used. But this would have meant hugging the northern shore right under the noses of the German sentries. So he had to go right down the middle, despite the fact that the water, even at high tide, was just 10 feet deep. Wow. Oh. To reduce the ship's draft, much of the heavy armor and the big guns had been removed. So if she did become grounded, she'd be a sitting duck. Oh. We did go across sandbanks a couple of times and dragged a bit going over. Um, but it was so quick that you hadn't got time to think, good God, if I'm marooned here, i would be shot to pieces. It's hard to know, really, what the German gunners in this pillbox were doing when the Campbelltown chugged by. I mean, yes, she'd been hurriedly converted to look a bit like a German ship, but she was trundling right down the shallows. You'd have thought that would have alerted them to the fact something was up, but obviously it didn't because they didn't open fire. And nor did the guns at the next pillbox or the one after wow. that. Wow. But then things started to go wrong. The RAF had finally agreed to stage a bombing raid, but the pilots had been told not to bomb if there was cloud cover in case they hit French civilians. Unfortunately, it was cloudy, and they hadn't been told what to do instead. So they just flew around, alerting the Germans to the fact that something was up. Mm. Their flak guns turned very easily down onto the um, surface of the river, plus their searchlights. With the Germans now suspicious, the Campbelltown's Heath Robinson modifications and fake German flag wouldn't fool them for long. And sure enough, they were soon challenged by a signal from the shore. But the British had a trick up their sleeves. We found the, um, the German code books, naval code books, and the Germans didn't know we had them. And so we had the up-to-date passwords and countersigns. And wow. we were using them much the consternation of the, the German signalman who was flashing signals asking who we were. And we were, we were flashing back the right answers. We're a friendly force coming in for the night. We've got a damaged ship or something like this, you see, and putting them off. Wow. That's genius. Wow. Dude. That's, that's oh, like a cheat man. code for the whole operation right there, huh? Anytime you get, hey, listen, counter, counter strike intelligence, counter military intelligence, man. Dude, you guys don't get enough praise, enough credit anyway. The stuff that's done behind the scenes in order for them to get the code books is amazing. That's probably yeah. an episode in and of itself. Yeah, like, yeah, how, to, how they got the How codes. they got that. That was probably a story in and of itself. But that's amazing. Yeah. That they didn't change it, nothing happened, no no leaks, nothing like that. Like, whew. Come oh, on now. man. Come on. Man. Man. Oh. 
Twice the Germans opened fire, but each time they were silenced by reassuring signals coming from the Campbell Town. This meant the ships could get nearer and nearer to the target. Eventually, though, the Germans realized that, yes, unbelievably, it really was a British raiding party sailing right through their front door. <laughs> oh, my God. managed to get to this point here, just 2,000 yards from the dock gates, which are kind of just round the uh, headland. Maybe you can see it just over there. And all hell broke loose. Oh, my God. There was an awful lot of stuff hitting Campbelltown. I mean, it was, it was absolutely hitting our poor little MLs, but uh, uh, Campbelltown being the big target, you know, and, and uh, there was a sort of glare of searchlights. The air was filled with things that whistled, hummed and shrieked, and every one of them lethal. The main focus for the German gunners was the bridge of the Campbelltown, where the captain, Beatty, was trying to keep a steady course by calling out steering directions. The chap at the wheel was killed. His place was taken by another rating, who was killed almost immediately. So then a chap called Montgomery, who was a Royal Engineer, took over, and he was standing there thinking, what do I do with this? When suddenly there was a tap on his shoulder, and a voice said, I'll take it, old man. And it was Tibbetts. The egghead, the brilliant scientist from Dartmouth, the man who designed the bomb in the bow, found himself at the wheel as the destroyer was on its final charge. I remember a red-hot shell passing through the wardroom just over our heads and going on out and didn't explode. If just one shell hit the rudder or the engine, or worse, the bomb in the bow, the mission would be over. But at this point, it wouldn't have mattered because Beatty was lined up on the wrong lighthouse, so he was heading for the wrong target. Oh, my God. No. At the last minute, a searchlight picked out the lighthouse over there, the green one, and Beatty realized his mistake. He barked out an order. So Tibbetts swung the wheel hard to the right to try and miss the jetty here, and then hard to the left again. And you've got to remember he's in a ship that doesn't handle doing 22 knots at night under a hail of enemy fire. And yet, he managed to just graze the, uh, the jetty there. It was just an extraordinarily brilliant piece of seamanship. Goodness gracious. They came round the old mole, but really shifting at this point. And pretty soon, you can pick out the dock gates. There they are, look. There they are. Maybe, I don't know, 500 metres to go. Really cranking it up now, the old girl. Imagine what it would have been like to have been doing this on that night in March 1942. Dark, searchlights, cannon, machine gun. Massive fire coming from that bank. Aiming straight for that. What's the impact going to be like? It's going to be huge. Here we go. Oh my God. putting Tibbetts' four-ton bomb right over the gate. And despite the firestorm, Beatty turned to his men and said, well, there we are, four minutes late. The Navy had done its part of the job brilliantly. And now, in the two and a half hours before Campbelltown blew, the Army had to get ashore and create havoc. Two and a half hours? Sheesh, that's a long time. That's a lifetime. Yeah. Holy Ooh. shit. Shit. That might as well be a month in military time oh! or, or you know, war time, I That's should say. Forever. Combat Five time. minutes is forever. I yeah. can't imagine. No, man. Ugh. Ugh. Yes, the Germans had fixed gun emplacements, and yes, they outnumbered the British by 20 to 1. But that was no problem, because the raiding party, remember, were commandos. They may have been picked for their intelligence and free thinking, but my 
God they were tough. Fire! The backbone of their training was speed marching, and each commando unit would compete to see who could go the furthest in the shortest time. One group went 63 miles in 19 hours. Wow. Another marched 53 miles from Harlech to the top of Mount Snowden and then down again in 17 and a half hours. And remember, they did this while carrying 60-pound packs on their backs. Oh. Determination is the most important thing, even on speed marches, where our great aim was to get the chaps to do 15 miles in full kit in just under three hours, finish up, well, on the salt course and firing, and then leisurely go up to the top of Ben Nevis. It's all part of mentally equipping them to do anything. Not only was commando training tough, but it was also revolutionary. The regular army would stay fit by doing star jumps in PE kit. The commandos trained in harsh terrain in battle dress. They invented the assault course. In fact, their methods were so advanced, they're still used by elite forces today. A determination, doing things which you thought you couldn't possibly do, like on the Tarzan course, on a rope bridge, or the death line. And don't forget, the chaps and commanders weren't super men. They were ordinary chaps from all walks of life, but they were trained well, trained to get the edge. Mm. Now, I'm going to ask a dumb question here. Did you go through commando training? Commando training? Fuck no. Okay, okay. I know people that did, and, like, you know, the, the, the off-the-cuff training, the special... Not complete special forces training, I was special operations, civil affairs. That's okay. my MOS. Um, you had to be compatible with what the special forces had to deal with, but okay. not what they had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Like, so mm -hmm. our, our bar was a lot lower than what they are. I will never claim to be what they are. Those guys up there are up there for a reason. Got it, um, got it. But this is, this is like, when I went in 2007, right, this is what they were training for. Like, this is how they train. This is full gear all the time. That's how you train because that's how you fight is full gear. This is – I like that. I like I, I like that. If they're revolutionary, if they set the pace, then hats off to you guys because that's that's great. Goodness. That, that revolutionized everything. Mm. So, yeah. Huh. And instead of doing weapons training on rifle ranges, commandos practiced in massive mock battles with live fire. Wow. All the weapon training was geared to offensive action. A little example, the Bren gun was normally fired on the ground. But why not use it, firing it from the hip? And this was an innovation. And they weren't just revolutionary with Ooh. guns either. They also learned unarmed combat, stuff no regular soldier had ever even heard of. Hmm. How to tackle a bloke with your bare hands. Knock him out, spoil his prospects and pinch his weapon. And his gold watch too, if he's got one. The key element was <laughs> getting themselves to convince themselves they could do anything. And you can only do that in the military sense if you train people to urge them on and wow. overcome their inner fears and give them supreme confidence. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. Back in San Nazaire, the commando raiding party would need all that confidence just to get ashore. We went up on deck and we went to the bows of the ship. Well, the 12 pounder bodies lying around the place, a lot of blood on the deck, and there was a hole in the deck. I remember Johnny Proctor lying there with his leg blown off, cheering us on. When I came up on deck, there was a brilliant flash and a ear-shattering explosion, and I felt a blow on my knee, which I felt like a sledgehammer, and it, it knocked my knee on one side, and I fell to the deck. 
and I was lying there and suddenly somebody across the rucksack and pulled me on my feet and said, you're right, lad, and it was Major Copeland. He said, bumble, lad, at port side. Don't hang about here, it's decidedly unhealthy. Tip Un- and golf were there. It's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. It's unhealthy. There you go. There you go. Downplaying it a lot. And they were holding their scaling ladders, and these two chaps were laughing and swearing and so on. And I think we probably dropped maybe even eight feet down onto the onto the dock. Mm. The next thing was uh, German. And they said, um, uh, handy hook. And I said, handy hook to you. While Tiger was having a set to with Jerry, the demolition teams were on their way to their targets. One of the main targets was this underground bunker because down there, and I'm not absolutely certain how I actually get down there, but anyway, down there are the pumps that were used for emptying all the water out of the dock. Okay. Stairs. <laughs> oh. The job of smashing this place up was given to a team of four commandos led by Lieutenant Stuart Chant. Huh. Chant, a stockbroker in peacetime, had to place the explosives, even though on the way to the pump house he'd been wounded in the left leg, the right arm, and both hands. Oh, my Unfortunately, God. Unfortunately, mm. the explosives had been pre-rigged in England with very short fuses. So, Chant sent his men back up to the surface in relative safety, knowing that when he lit the fuses, he'd have just 90 seconds to climb seven flights of Oh, my God. To find his way through this maze of aerial walkways in the pitch black, because there was no light down here then. Oh, my While God. pretty badly wounded. I'm going to say that's impossible. Well, the human body can do a lot, yep. especially if you're if you're tasked to do a lot. Yeah. Depends yeah. what's driving you. Depends what's driving you. Mm-hmm. What your motivation yep. is. What your motivation is. Yes. Um, yeah, that's crazy, man. Mm. Holy shit. He's a brave man. Chant made it. Wow. Wow. My the goodness. pumping house was gone. And meanwhile, other teams were having similar successes with the winding houses at wow. both ends of the dock. Mm. I went up to my colonel and saluted him and said, so we've blown up the northern winding house. And he said, well done, old boy. So I said, I'm now ready to go back to England, sir. At half past two in the morning, the surviving commandos came here, where they'd arranged to meet the small boats that would take them home. They were pleased as punch with the way things had gone. But the elation was short-lived because the scene that greeted them out in the estuary was truly horrific. Mm. What? Almost all of the wooden MLs with their oh exposed fuel tanks had been blown to smithereens. According to witnesses, the whole estuary was on fire. Chaps were drowning. There were pools of burning fuel. Oh, and my water. God. You, you had to kick with your feet like mad to try and steer the raft away from the railway, from the flames. And uh, it was an uh, absolute inferno. There was a sort of sea of black. You could see sort of sinking boats and hear shots coming from the and so on. Um, and then very quickly, the colonel said, it was obvious that there was no transport home. So um, he said, right, we'll fight our way out of the town. And oh, my God. Small groups and make our way severally across the Spanish border. I thought, uh, that's a bit... Uh, of a tall order. <sighs> Man. Yeah, that's a bit of a tall order, huh? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Extraction. 
Mm. Extraction never goes as planned. No. no. Oh my god, dude. Oh, dude. Mm. <laughs> How do you deal with that? How do you? <laughs> oh, I don't that's know. tough. That's that's like, you do your shit, and then you're like, oh my god, we we did it. There's no ride home. Mm -mm. Holy shit. You make your ride home. That's when you hit those plan C's to Z's, man. Mm -hmm. And everything after Z. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> but yeah, man. Spain was a daunting 350 miles away. <laughs> what? But even before they could set off, they'd have to fight their way out of San Nazaire itself. So that's 5,000 Germans who by this stage were awake, alert, and organized against fewer than 120 Brits, half of whom were wounded. Mm. If you're street fighting, you must secure any crossing. Tiger Watson came round this corner, found himself face to face with a German sniper. I ran forward, saw him lean forward, pressed the trigger of my Thompson submachine gun, and typically Watson, the magazine was empty. Click, click. Oof. Unfortunately, his magazine wasn't empty, and uh, his shot broke my arm and bowled me over. A party of Germans ran up to him, and one of them actually used the cliched expression, for you, the war is over. And I thought, well, uh, it will have to you know, escape eventually, but uh, don't feel quite up to it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I was almost certain I'd be killed because there was a watch point, a tower, uh, and I had to go past it. The Germans must have seen me, and I knew they'd fire, and they did, but they hit me in the back and the arm and the leg. Chant, the stockbroker who'd blown up the pumping house, made it to this point when a machine gun bullet fired from the top of the U-boat pens over there, took his knee joint out. He was no longer able to walk, so he was captured as well. The commandos realized that they were trapped on an island and that the only way off it and into the town was across this bridge, which was guarded by what must have seemed like half the German army. By the time they got here, there were only 80 of them left, but plainly, they still had some fighting spirit left because they just formed themselves into a sort of great big mass and charged. Oh my God. Captain Roy now led the assault across the bridge. Streams of bullets hitting those girders, ricocheting off the roadway. Machine guns, pom-poms, rifles. It was like a damn good November the 5th, only more so. Bit by bit, the commando numbers were whittled down until the remaining men, low on ammo, went to ground in the town. Corin Purden ended up in a cellar. We suddenly heard all this shouting outside, and then the door burst open, and there were... Germans standing there with their curl scuttle helmets and their weapons, looking terribly tense. Frankly, if I'd been there, I'd have chuckled, chucked a couple of hand grenades down and finished us off, but they didn't. And the colonel, who had his pipe in his mouth, just sort of walked up the steps and said, well, we've, we've done what we came to do, um, you know, that's that. God. As dawn broke, the battle was pretty much over. Just five of the landing party would eventually make it to Spain in freedom, and 220 five? would escape the horror on the few Oh my wooden God! Five? five? Five made it to Spain. Five made it the 300 miles? Where's that story? Mm. Holy shit! Shoo. That's. Oh my God! Mm. Of the 600 or so men who'd come to France the previous evening, 214 had been taken prisoner. Oh. And 168 were dead. Mm. And worse still, it was now 7 a.m., three hours after the bomb in Campbelltown's nose was supposed to have gone off. Oh, my God. After we were washed ashore, we were put in the back of the lorry, driven into the town, and we were in this, this big room. And they 
the uh, Germans brought in a, a sailor they fished out of the river and put him on the table and, and said, you know, you try and revive him. And we, we tried to get the water out of his lungs. And by this time, uh, we were saying to one another, you know, the, the Campbell Town hasn't gone up. The British could only console themselves that despite the failure, they had at least fought like lions. They were patting us on the back there. The Germans were amazing. Yes, I mean, they probably couldn't believe it that, uh, that anybody would venture up into a submarine base heavily defended. Some of the stories of bravery were incredible. Out in the estuary, one of the surviving MLs had gone head to head with a much more powerful German destroyer. The British gunner, a commando called Sergeant Tom Duran, was asked to surrender on a number of occasions, but even though he'd been shot 16 times, he kept on firing until he was overcome by the loss of blood and passed out. Mm. Oh my but the story doesn't end there because the captain of the German destroyer was so impressed by Durant's bravery but when he landed, he took the trouble to find the most senior British officer and said, look, I don't know who was on that gun on that little ship, but whoever it was should get your Victoria Cross. And he got it. One of five awarded as a result of the action that night. Whoa, 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 whoa. Five? Five VCs. All right, so 1,300 have been awarded. Yeah, not 13,000. Right. Yeah, that's another part. That's another one three zero zero. Yes, um, that's crazy. So this awarded that man. I mean, that's it. Just goes to show you what this meant, what mm -hmm. this was. This is uh, wow. That's the fact that you had a Nazi commander say, "Hey, you need to be whoever that was, whoever that." That boat commander was. He you needs need, something. You need a damn VC for that. He needs something. Because that was admirable. Mm. So that's crazy. Goodness. So the commandos had fought well, but all they had to show for it was a destroyed pumping house and two damaged winding stations. Even at 10 a.m., the Campbelltown still hadn't exploded. And by this stage, the ship was crawling with German souvenir hunters. There was a real possibility the bomb might be discovered and diffused. At one point in the morning, Mickey Byrne was marched along here, right past where the Campbelltown was embedded in the gates and that called for a remarkable piece of acting he couldn't look pleased that it was crawling with germans he couldn't look quizzical wondering why the bomb hadn't gone off and nor could he look afraid that it might go off at that precise moment blowing him to pieces among the prisoners was the campbell town's captain sam Beatty, who was being held in a nearby hut i was interrogated by a german who spoke very good english he discovered that I'd been in Campbelltown, and he was remarking that it was no good ramming a stout gassoon like that with a flimsy ship. At that moment, there was a bang. The blast wrecked the gate. Thousands of gallons of water <laughs> roared in, taking what remained of the British ship with it. And the German souvenir hunters? They found bits of them on the roof of the U-boat pens, <coughs> 400 yards away. Oh, my God. Dude! It was oh only a matter God. of time. That's terrifying. Yeah. Like, well done. But, like... What a delay. Yeah. Pause for effect. Yeah. For, what, what was it, at least three, four, five hours? Like something like that? Ten hours. Ten hours. Ten something hours. Something like that. Like, and they but, thought everyone was wrapping up, cooling down. Hey, man, we're good. Go send the souvenir hunters. Let's, let's see what they got. Yeah, but... Holy shit. But if you're those British commandos, then what, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to... Let the cat out of the bag? Did you get a bomb on there? No. No, you, I guess you're just like, oh, man, we were just, just supposed to ram the shit. and It's supposed to work. So. Mm. 
You know, it's, we're so dumb. I'm so sorry. That's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. You caught us. Mm. But then. Not bad. We, you caught yeah, us. Caught us. But then, it, boom. <laughs> oh, God. Joke's on you. Uh, those sneaky British. Damn. <laughs> the fact, like, the fact that it exploded, like, alleviated the Atlantic. Like, mm -hmm. That's such a massive win. Yeah. That, why haven't I learned about that? That should be World War Two, one hundred and one. Yeah, that, the the first class right yep. there. Mm -hmm. Wow. A German petty officer rushed into the room where we were lying, saying, "We're going to shoot you all. We're going to kill you all." It was, uh, we just were so sort of exhausted and everything else <laughs> that we were delighted that the explosion had occurred. And just said, oh, do, please don't shout, just get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hitler was so incensed that he later issued his infamous order that in future all captured commandos would be executed as spies. Small wonder, damage to the Normandy dock was so comprehensive that it was not repaired until 1947, two years after the war was over. Wow. Oh, wow. As a result, Tirpitz was denied a home base in the Atlantic. And as a result of that, she was forced to spend most of the war in a fjord in Norway. She was finally destroyed by RAF bombers in 1944. And incredibly, this mighty battleship, the pride of the German Navy, went to the bottom, having never sunk so much as a fishing boat. In the smoke wow. of giant explosions, the turpits capsizes and sinks. Wow. The price for rendering this great ship impotent had been high. 168 British dead, around 400 Germans and 16 French, shot by mistake by SS troops. Mm. Still, the attack did mean that Churchill could say to the British and the world, we're not done yet. And it helped in France as well. One very important thing is what the French Prime Minister said to us on our first return to Saint Nazaire. He said, you were the first who gave us hope. And what of the men, the commandos, and the sailors who brought them on this, the greatest raid of all? Well, Tommy Durrant, the sergeant who took on a German destroyer, was captured and died of his wounds shortly afterwards. The bomb designer, Nigel Tibbetts, after he'd steered the Campbelltown into the dock gate, helped wounded men onto a nearby ML and headed for home. But his little boat was hit by machine gun fire, and as his wife had predicted, he was killed. Mm. After being captured, Mickey Byrne was sent to Colditz. After the war, he became a journalist, and today he lives in Wales, where his hobby is reading poetry. What a world we might have made. Tiger Watson was sent to the Spangenberg camp. After coming home, he qualified as a doctor and ended up in Africa, helping victims of leprosy. True, couldn't be truer. Yes, you were afraid, but you couldn't afford to be a coward. Today, the great moments of military history are marked with imposing monuments, and their anniversary is honored with much pomp and ceremony. But to find a memorial to the greatest raid of all, you have to go to a car park in Falmouth, in Cornwall. It's just a rock propped up against some railings. And it seems rather small. Mm. I've always had the feeling that anything that really offers some hope 
whether it's international or national or even individuals have the idea of your own and it's impossible never think so try it good night That's crazy. Wow. You know, you're never... One doesn't expect to come back from a suicide mission. No. no. The fact that any are alive to tell the tale of this suicide mission is a freaking miracle. Yeah, and that's what it is. It's a suicide mission. You know. And in all definitions yeah. of it. Like, you, you get those. You, get the, you, you look at the, the schematics because, I don't know... I don't, know, I don't know how it was run then, but oh, now like you kind of, you know, you kind of understand what it is when you get it, and you're like, this is a no-win situation. This is, we're not all of us are coming back. Oh yeah. Kind of moment oh, yeah. in the briefing room. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone knows their job. You're trained on your job. You understand that. Okay. People in this room are not going to be the people in this room afterwards. You know, there's going to be a lot less. Yeah. And with that realization, you still go and perform to the best of your ability. Yeah. I mean, dude, it took more than 50%. It took like 75% loss mm -hmm. on that mission. Yeah. And none of them were supposed to make it. No. Zero were supposed to make it. Yeah. And even the, the what was it, the Navy was like, no, nah, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah. So... Dude, I mean, for bravery, I mean, this takes this takes the cake. Like, this yeah. is this is, I get why. The Victoria Cross was awarded, uh, so much during this one event. Yeah, yeah, and and as we've learned <laughs> that those are freaking hard to get, and yeah. five of them were handed out for this one. Yeah, but it's not as talked about as I all the parts of World War Two. I never knew about this, but I mean, if you think about it, it's one of the most. This secured the Atlantic. Like that's huge for for trade for for um, for supplies for troops. Like this is a massive moment. Yeah, you know, you take a you take a a, a massive ship out of the waters. That's you you did amazing. Yeah, you did a damn big thing. You yeah, know, uh, but yeah, no, this is this is great. I mean, I mean, how do we rate this? Do we do the automatic like, two thumbs up? Like, not enough. Automatic. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't say it immediately at first because you know that's that's it's more of a uh, subject matter that deserves a further discussion There's, than yeah. just you know, ha ha, this is funny. All yeah, yeah. no, 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 this is deserving of all respect and reverence to the sacrifice of the people that made the ultimate sacrifice in this moment. For real, and it's just like that little. I'm sorry, I'm very upset about that size of a monument. Yeah. Like, that's tough. Like, and it's not on them. They didn't want to do it for a monument. But a monument sparks conversation, yeah. which sparks intrigue, which sparks knowledge. Yeah. So that shit should be massive. Yeah. And that was what I was going to ask everybody here and that's watching is, like, when this doc came out, did it spark um, more discussion about it and maybe granted more respect and maybe a... I don't want to say bigger or better, uh, what do you call it, um, a thing was erected in, in, I, in its honor. I I don't know. Like, simple, simple, stupid. Like, I get that. Like, the, the people, the families, they just want the recognition of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They don't need the big spectacle and relive that shit every moment. They right. don't need that. They don't need that at all. But, but for future generations, for future soldiers for future people willing to make that sacrifice that thing needs to be substantial not just a rock on a dock right right that way all the people you mentioned can look that in the eye and uh look look that and appreciate what was what was done yeah because i mean I'm, let me just put this out there there's monuments in like gettysburg like right up the road from my house yeah yeah and they're massive and you're like what is this who is this for? And it's just a unit. I'm like, yeah. It sparks debates, sparks conversation, yeah. sparks knowledge, sparks curiosity. Yeah. And 
from what we've seen of this, I think I think we're in agreement. Yeah, this deserves so. that amount of yeah. respect. One hundred percent. That's what it is. It's deserving of respect. The monument should match respect. Yeah. That's what it is. It it shouldn't be minuscule, at all. Ever any sacrifice ever made in wartime should never be met with minuscule amounts of respect. You know, exactly. not the bare minimum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's barely the bare minimum. Man. Yeah, that's no. They gave their maximum. You deserve to match that. Yeah. Period. Mm-hmm. So. Exactly. Um. Yeah. This was. I mean. Again. This was freaking amazing. I didn't know about this. Yeah. I. And if you didn't know about it, I didn't know about it. So. So it's good to know. It's good to know. This is. This just adds that different layer. Yeah. To to this channel, to our knowledge, to our journey. Yeah. I so. mean, lately we're on a big history kick. So. Yeah. Uh, Put some more history stuff down in the comments. Like yes. the long ones, the short ones. Uh, we're we're here for it, man. We definitely we're, are. It's we definitely a, it's are. Uh, it's they're always fun to check out yes. and yes. kind of get a more deep discussion going about stuff as yeah. opposed to oh that was funny hey that song's great yeah yeah or that song's amazing that song's like the Beatles like no this is fucking awesome yeah exactly this is like let's talk about these things these yep. things happened mm-hmm. that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for watching, y'all. And after you do that, there's somewhere around to subscribe, somewhere around to watch another video. Wash your hands, scrap your drop your toes, wipe your butt, blow your nose, embrace the suck. Unplug and do something epic and read history. See y'all next time. Later, guys. Fellas, we could be that mistake. Let's do this.